good. <laughs> uh, well, thank you, everyone. Thanks for the introductions. It's a pleasure um, giving this talk. And as uh, uh, actually you all heard, this is really what I do. I'm looking at the human factors in, in cybercrime. And today um, you will be hearing a little bit because actually this topic is so huge. Uh, we could do a number of seminars around these, uh, these topics. Uh, but today you will hear a little bit around both the, uh, the offenders, but also the victims. And um, actually anything that has to do with human behavior or um, actually aspects such as personality traits uh, that can actually shape uh, or actually lead someone towards delinquency and criminal behavior. Um, so you will be hearing um, a bit of the theory behind uh, criminal behavior. So uh, touching upon criminology, touching upon psychology uh, and bringing all that um, into kind of understanding cybercrime. Um, as I said, you will be hearing about online offenders, but also the victim side. Um, so I will start with online offenders. Um, who are they? Uh, so and actually online offenders is, is really the term that we tend to use uh, in, in academia and in the kind of cybercrime um, area. But uh, mostly you might have heard the term cyber criminals. This is um, how usually um, uh, this is the term we usually use. But who are they? There are a number of misconceptions um, about online offenders or cyber criminals. Um, that they're usually male, uh, usually teenage boys um, who have high technical skills, high IQ, and possibly they're a bit geeky um, or, they're, or they're called kind of nerds, um, that they're not real uh, because they don't operate in the real world. And that means there's no impact. Um, so that's a big misconception. Uh, and they're never violent. Uh, also, um, uh, we see that, for example, when we talk about espionage or organized uh, criminal groups, they, these can be violent and they can have enormous impact, not just at the kind of uh, individual level, but even at the national level. And uh, that online offenders fit one profile. And I've been actually trying to accomplish that, but it doesn't work. There's no one fit profile for all online offenders. So um, yes, that's definitely a misconception. Um, as I said, uh, there is a, a number of theories um, coming from criminology, psychology, or other actually other fields that are trying to kind of um, understand um, the different factors that actually lead someone towards delinquency and criminal behavior. And here I have um, a Joker. This is uh, from his uh, from the latest film. Um, if you have seen it, you might understand what I'm uh, trying to to say um, here. Um, we see that for some individuals, there's a number of factors, the social background, it could be mental health issues, so many other, other factors that can actually um, shape an individual's behavior and lead them towards criminal, uh, criminal behavior. And this is really what um, uh, researchers uh, looking at the human factor of cybercrime are also trying to understand. And this has been happening for decades now, not necessarily uh, looking at cybercrime specifically, but uh, for uh, offline crime. Um, uh, so I will present a number of theories very, very briefly, um, uh, applying these theories uh, from uh, different fields to uh, online criminal uh, behavior. And you might say, why is this important? Why do we want to understand online offenders? Um, and as you will see from uh, both the theory, but also uh, the research findings that I will be presenting, uh, it, it, it is important to understand um, um, the background, uh, the motives, um, and in general, um, the uh, behavior of online offenders in order to um, uh, shape uh, and develop effective interventions. And actually, um, we've been working with the National Crime Agency looking specifically at all these issues uh, when the NCA were um, developing the cease and desist program for specifically targeting 
teenagers uh, that were actually entering um, uh, online criminal behavior. Uh, so actually all this, um, uh, the, uh, the, this theoretical background that I will be describing uh, today um, has been already applied and is being applied, especially uh, in kind of the law enforcement um, uh, perspective and work. Uh, as I said, there are a number of theories um, around crime, trying to explain crime. And this list is, is really not, um, it's just a selection of these uh, theories, it's not extensive. Um, the social construction of crime, even biological theories, learning theories, personality trait theories, um, or uh, even um, uh, as you can see here, neutralization theories, um, uh, theories around addiction and arousal, labeling theories, geographical theories, routine activity theory. And if you have uh, been looking at um, literature around cybercrime and the human factor, you might um, now identify some of these theories, because especially when it comes to neutralization theory, this is a theory that comes up in most of uh, academic papers when trying to kind of understand criminal behavior online. Um, and it refers to um, the offenders tending to neutralize or uh, their behavior or um, um, present excuses around their behavior or even denying uh, that uh, their actions can have actual impact or harm a victim. And this is actually very common. Uh, for example, a hacker might say, I'm just hacking a website. Um, how can this cause any harm to an individual um, physically? But as you can see later on, when I talk about the, uh, the victims, uh, you will see that um, even um, a simple uh, attack can have um, enormous implications and an impact on individuals. Um, the routine activity theory um, suggests that a crime uh, needs three variables to occur at the same time. Um, and actually, we need, of course, a motivated offender, a suitable target, and the absence of guardians. And if we actually translate that and apply this theory to cybercrime, we would expect, for example, a computer being uh, hacked because it is a suitable target. Um, uh, for example, um, uh, there's a lack of uh, antivirus software or a firewall, so it is actually um, um, uh, kind of a weak um, or unprotected computer, but is uh, also noticed by a motivated offender. Mm. Uh, so it, it has been identified as a vulnerable um, um, network or computer. Uh, and um, so um, uh, then it becomes really the suitable target. Um, also, um, uh, we've seen the social construction of crime theory being applied to cybercrime, um, saying that it is important to consider how crime is not static, it's uh, universal and um, uh, it needs no explanation in itself, uh, as Howard says. Um, and actually this uh, theory talks about how society determines what crime is and what isn't. Uh, but when it comes to cybercrime, we've seen challenges as different types of attacks and behaviors online were emerging, um, legislation didn't necessarily uh, consider these behaviors as illegal. Uh, and that was um, a challenge uh, and, um, for specific behaviors. But for others, such as child pornography online, for example, um, these um, behaviors were kind of easy to apply to offline um, uh, legislation on child pornography uh, and apply that to the online kind of aspects of that behavior. Um, so again, social construction of crime is, is really important. For some cultures, um, it might mean something completely different. Uh, and as you will see in a paper I will present, um, uh, we've been looking in underground forums and how different subcultures of actual hacking groups might consider crime in completely different ways um, and have misconceptions of what um, is cybercrime uh, and what isn't. 
Um, but also we have uh, um, applications of the addiction and arousal theory, especially when it comes uh, to, uh, for example, cyber stalkers or hackers uh, who might be looking uh, for that kind of arousal and cessation seeking um, coming from, uh, from uh, their accomplishments. Uh, for example, we see that hackers who uh, manage to hack um, government websites um, are bragging about their accomplishments to their um, uh, peers. Uh, so that kind of sensation seeking is very common uh, in hacking groups. Um, labeling theory. Um, you might have heard this, um, the application of this theory in maybe other concepts, but when it comes to um, cybercrime and kind of that label of criminal, um, we tend to see that individuals who have that label behave, tend to behave accordingly, so they are more likely to engage in further criminal activity. Um, and uh, similarly, labeling theory um, can be applied um, uh, in the cases of, of hackers, where many different labels uh, have been associated with various types of hacking activity. And uh, I guess uh, the most kind of obvious one is the white hat hackers or black hat hackers. Um, hackers seem to differentiate um, based on um, their label, based on the motive and how they apply their skills for um, potentially um, profit and um, um, uh, gain or um, for the common good, for example. Um, then uh, we have geographical theories uh, talking about, um, similarly to um, the social kind of concept of, of crime, um, talking about the different hotspots of cybercrime. You might have heard that term, especially for countries such as Brazil, Nigeria, China, Russia, and the US. Um, we see um, many cyber criminal groups emerging and thriving, um, turning these countries into cybercrime hotspots. As as I was saying. Um, uh, and again, there are many reasons um, uh, why this would happen, for example. Uh, why is Brazil or Nigeria becoming a hotspot? Um, uh, so there, there is work analyzing um, uh, these uh, kind of aspects and these trends. But um, maybe I could say that we see, for example, Nigeria being very vulnerable at the national level uh, in terms of legislation um, for our cybercrime or their networks uh, not uh, being as secure. Um, so, um, for example, in Nigeria, networks are being exploited from criminals uh, based in other countries. So Nigeria is becoming a hotspot, not necessarily by criminals based in Nigeria, but uh, criminals or criminal groups based um, in other countries nearby or even in other continents. Um, so there is uh, interesting work around um, these theories, actually. And we have also theories coming from um, kind of the uh, biology uh, um, and um, kind of explanations around crime, uh, looking at genetics, uh, the levels of neurotransmitters and hormones. Um, so, as I was saying, some of the misconceptions around online offenders is that most of them are male, and in in uh, part of this is true because we tend to see male um, online offenders being identified or prosecuted even, um, but that is not necessarily the case. And actually, um, colleagues doing work around the human factor of cybercrime have identified that uh, uh, women hackers are equally uh, actually um, uh, competent uh, when it comes to their hacking skills, uh, but uh, they're not usually caught or identified by law enforcement because they could be supporting someone um, or they could be kind of, kind of in the second level uh, of, um, of action when it comes to hacking. Uh, so it's not so easy for them to, to be identified, but uh, that's um, uh, overall a big misconception. And finally, psychoanalytic theories. Um, as I said, you will hear about a, a little bit about psychology today. Um, so um, there are actually um, uh, discussions around how um, uh, criminal behavior might be uh, actually um, uh, uh, 
caused or caring due to um, the um, uh, superego not being formed properly. And superego refers to the kind of internalization of society's morals and standards. So if uh, superego in childhood is not properly uh, kind of formed, that means um, more disinhibition, uh, more um, kind of lack of um, uh, constraints or restraints in, in terms of, uh, of criminal behavior. Um, and going a bit uh, more closer to, to psychology, I wanted to present some of the main theories correlating um, personality traits and criminal behavior. Going back to the kind of traditional theories of Ising um, and the Penn model uh, back in the 60s and 70s, um, and Ising was one of the first actually um, who introduced psychology into understanding criminal behavior. And he actually uh, discussed about um, traits uh, um, uh, that uh, were describing, for example, psychoticism, extroversion, and neuroticism as being linked uh, to individuals who were more susceptible to criminal behavior. Then in the 90s, this uh, model, Isaac's uh, theory, was expanded and actually um, a new uh, model emerged, uh, which is very, very popular uh, nowadays, the five-factor model. And even more recently, we have um, the hexaco model um, with uh, even more traits and, and personality kind of aspects linked to criminal behavior. Um, so Isaac talked about psychoticism, extroversion, and neuroticism uh, as being uh, related to criminal behavior offline, obviously. Um, so uh, a little bit about um, the kind of three uh, aspects here. Psychoticism in general describes um, an individual or a personality that is antisocial, uncaring, um, aggressive. Um, extroversion is quite easy. Um, uh, usually an individual who is an extrovert is seeking uh, stimulation from the external environment. Uh, so they might be socializing with peers with other groups. Um, and neuroticism refers to a personality that is unstable, um, potentially with depression, low self-esteem, anxiety. So combining all these aspects and, and talking about higher levels of, of these traits um, uh, led Ising to think that uh, these are related to criminal behavior offline. Um, the five-factor model um, kind of um, added um, some new factors, um, as you see here, openness, agreeableness, and conscientiousness. Um, and here, um, an individual who is um, um, low in openness uh, is someone who is closed up, uh, who doesn't have uh, social skills, for example. Um, someone who is low in agreeableness uh, is someone who is irritable, critical of others, uh, ruthless, potentially. And someone who's low in conscientiousness is someone who is disorganized, lazy, um, having no specific aim in, in life. Um, so this model suggests that the combination of the, of the five factors, um, and especially lower levels of, um, of some of these factors, lead to, um, can lead to criminal behavior. Um, so here, actually, um, I have examples of, of a study showing that the presence of school problems during uh, adolescence was likely to contribute to criminal behavior for men, specifically more than women, um, and leading uh, to criminal behavior. So we see that there are studies looking at these aspects from early on um, um, uh, in, in school years for teenagers, trying to kind of predict which are the characteristics that might separate specific teenagers going towards criminal behavior compared to um, others who might not. And there, there are different, um, a, a variety of methods actually followed to accomplish that. Obviously, you need uh, a long-term um, approach comparing um, potential uh, traits and behavior now in six months, in two years. So um, uh, I, these studies are, are never really a one-off study. 
And finally, the hexaco model, where we have two new um, factors, the uh, emotionality and honesty, humility um, uh, factors here. Um, the emotionality, of course, talks about um, empathy uh, or lack of empathy um, and potentially the inhibited emotional response to others. Um, the honesty humility factor talks about um, or dis would describe someone who's manipulative, uh, who takes advantage of others, uh, or has a sense of entitlement. Um, uh, um, and, and as you will see later on, uh, we have uh, many examples of narcissists, actually, as I was saying, bragging for their accomplishments. Um, so we have studies that have reported correlations between honesty humility dimension and the dark triad of personality which I will describe um, uh, right next. Um, you might have heard, coming from criminology and psychology, you might have heard of the psycho killer. Um, uh, so we see psychopathy as one of the most common traits of serious killers, for example, if we think about offline crime. Um, but uh, also we see um, that uh, these... Uh, factors, psychopathy, narcissism, and Machiavellianism actually are met uh, in uh, insider threat cases when we talk about um, um, cybercriminal activity in the workplace, for example. And of course, when we talk about narcissism, we talk about that sense of entitlement, that grandiosity, um, uh, of an individual. And um, I will describe later on um, the characteristics of a Machiavellian leader. Uh, usually, uh, Machiavellianism describes someone who is manipulative, domineering, um, so they can actually be a very effective leader of a criminal group, for example. Um, so as I was saying um, in the beginning, why are we interested in understanding personality traits or behaviors of online offenders? And as I was saying, it's very important to inform interventions and law enforcement have been looking at this for years. Um, and for example, we have studies early on in the 80s and 70s um, uh, looking at um, uh, these different theories and how they can be applied to crime. So for example, a high extrovert delinquent um, will not respond well to punishment, um, for example, if they are uh, prosecuted uh, and that uh, that kind of punishment might not inhibit their behavior. Uh, so this means that we have to think of something alternative, a new intervention approach. And if we translate that to cybercrime, what does that even mean? And obviously, I don't have the answer at the moment, but as you can see, there's a lot of um, uh, work that needs to be done uh, applying all this existing knowledge to cybercrime and see whether basically we see differences in between offline and online uh, criminal behavior. When it comes to neurotic delinquents, uh, again, it's quite different due to, as I was saying, um, their unstable personality um, to um, condition um, uh, their behavior and therefore they're likely less um, possible to learn from their mistakes through judicial punishment again. So um, they require a more kind of subdued approach in interventions uh, due to potential higher anxiety levels. Um, and finally, when it comes to delinquents who score high on psychoticism, um, we've seen Isaac kind of claiming that they're slow um, to learn from their behavior and they're very impulsive. So again, they wouldn't learn from their mistakes necessarily. So um, uh, high uh, individuals high on psychoticism would benefit but more uh, from highly structured settings. So these are really um, findings and food for thought for law enforcement, but also for uh, policymakers. Um, and as I was saying, um, there are really quite big differences at this more at this point when it comes to legislation in different countries or continents. Um, so, uh, for example, when uh, developing um, legislation, all these aspects need to be considered, um, not just what cybercrime means or what we can consider as cr crime and criminal behavior and can be criminalized, but um, how do we intervene, uh, what kind of punishments um, uh, or potentially rewards can we offer to offenders? And it might sound really um, 
strange to talk about rewards, but we have examples of, for example, the NCA or the FBI offering um, offenders uh, a kind of potential, uh, rather than going to prison, to actually offer their skills um, and services to, um, to law enforcement. So that might work better for some offenders than just spending a couple of years in prison. Um, so to sum up around personal traits and characteristics, we have already seen studies looking at the differences between um, uh, criminal behavior offline and online. As you can see here, we have the PEN model by Azeng, but uh, when it comes to um, online criminal behavior, we have a number of uh, aspects that are linked to, uh, to that behavior and online delinquency. Um, the main difference here, as you will notice, is that uh, with offline criminal behavior, extroversion was identified as kind of a main personal trait and characteristic, while for online criminal behavior, we see that introversion is most common. So we see, um, and actually this is becoming a stereotype uh, of hackers being isolated in their uh, bedroom or their office, uh, practicing their skills alone, uh, not necessarily uh, engaging with others or socializing. But um, still, we see neuroticism, psychoticism um, being identified as uh, traits and characteristics uh, met also in online criminal behavior, along with um, non-agreeableness, narcissism, antisocial behavior, that um, uh, over-exaggerated sense of self-worth and strong uh, need for affirmation, loose ethical boundaries, low or fragile self-esteem. And as um, actually uh, we've seen in many cases, um, offenders with low self-esteem uh, might uh, be going uh, into hacking and uh, kind of uh, bragging to their peers about their accomplishments. And this uh, works as a way to kind of um, uh, enhance their uh, low self-esteem. And um, going back to the theories I was uh, describing earlier on kind of addiction and arousal, um, feeling that change uh, between offline and online behavior and self-esteem, someone might feel that sense of arousal when um, having specific hacking accomplishments and kind of feeling that uh, uh, appreciation and um, um, from their peers. So their self-esteem uh, is, is enhanced and that um, might then lead them into engaging uh, in that behavior uh, just to um, kind of um, uh, have that arousal and sense of uh, um, uh, self high self-esteem uh, continuously. However, uh, we've seen forensic psychology, um, there are a number of other factors uh, and cognitive traits that might be related to offending, uh, such as moral development, empathy, intelligence, even self-control, impulsiveness. Um, but um, apart from personality traits and, and behavior, we uh, cannot forget about, uh, we cannot neglect the motivation behind uh, such behaviors. And you can see here different motives, uh, starting from hacktivism, uh, espionage, uh, if you're targeting a whole nation, for example, uh, monetary gain or political or religious um, beliefs. But also we see, uh, and actually some of, of my uh, colleagues uh, back in Cambridge, uh, the Cambridge Cybercrime Center, they looked at specifically the curiosity and boredom motive. And actually we saw that during the pandemic, um, uh, hacking uh, and actually cyber attacks uh, were emerging um, due to boredom. So we saw that many teenagers engaged and practiced their hacking skills more during the pandemic due to their curiosity and boredom. Basically, they didn't have anything better to do. Um, but also we see um, uh, motivating factors such as emotion uh, or sexual impulses uh, when it comes to cyber stalkers, for example, uh, or online harassment. Um, uh, and that sense of um, enhancement of self-worth or manipulating others can be a motive by itself. Um, I talked about uh, how narcissists or Machiavellians might actually um, uh, enjoy manipulating others. And the interesting aspect when uh, actually talking about the differences between online and offline criminal behavior is that um, 
usually um, Machiavellian um, leaders or um, narcissists might um, behave completely differently in their offline in real life uh, so they might be very shy uh, as I was saying they might have low self-esteem so we see um, uh, usually creating a completely different persona online um, and going back to the disinhibition theory and effect uh, of the internet uh, we see the internet kind of kind of uh, leading into this uh, this kind of, of behavior um, in terms of the motives, uh, we have um, different groups uh, or actually different labels um, uh, that uh, uh, many studies are actually uh, identifying. Uh, we see um, hackers starting from uh, novices or script kiddies uh, and newbies starting as the, based on their curiosity and uh, the thrill of, of hacking up to insiders um, uh, that are targeting uh, their employer or a specific organization, hacktivists uh, with political uh, kind of uh, motivations, um, uh, having a specific cause uh, that uh, um, they're trying to kind of communicate, um, crackers uh, or professional criminals uh, that are looking and targeting uh, data usually. Um, and actually looking, um, having as their motive, not just profit, but um, um, they're enhancing their ego, their status, and finally government agents um, uh, that might be targeting uh, other nations. Uh, and, and again, uh, we're talking about espionage here, um, having as a motive uh, different ideologies or causes. Um, so um, I think this kind of illustrates um, the different types and characteristics of offenders, but also the, how a different motive might um, not just provide a different label uh, to an offender, but um, how and it illustrates how different cases can be. So as I was saying, initially, we cannot provide one profile for a specific um, a group of hackers or for a specific type of hackers. We, um, when we talk about profiling, uh, we have to look at various factors and most of the times they're not common to each um, hacker, for example. So uh, it's more complicated, uh, if I may say, than um, it might look. Um, so very briefly, a few research findings in this area. We see um, Murphy was one of the first kind of researchers looking in, in this um, area and looking at um, the behaviors and characteristics of hackers. And as you can see here, he's talking about hackers being loners with poor self-esteem and a greater ability to interact with computers and technology than with people, uh, which agrees with the theory uh, that was describing before by Ising. Um, but uh, also uh, we see that um, this characterizes more a loner hacker. When we talk about organized hacking groups, uh, we might see um, offenders being kind of more socially conscious, having um, uh, skills and ability to kind of socialize and be a part of a team, a member of a group. Um, however, uh, a recent um, uh, forensic psychologist, Kiron, was talking about hackers having weak relationships with family members uh, in comparison to non-hackers. So again, um, this can be an interesting element when profiling, um, for example, a hacker. Uh, it might not mean anything at this point stand alone uh, as, as a characteristic but as part of the profiling process it might actually um, provide interesting uh, insights to law enforcement and i was talking about the insider threat cases um, and we've seen um, research by Leg et al talking about uh, personality traits as being a key factor in whether an individual can be an insider threat and uh, cause a breach uh, and that could be accidentally or maliciously. Um, 
but uh, when going a bit kind of uh, deeper into understanding an insider, we see that insiders might be poor team players. Usually um, it, they might work for the IT um, department. Uh, they might have a desire to explore networks or break security codes, uh, but usually they're isolated uh, from other team members or they even lack social skills. And that loneliness and social naivety um, might lead them into behaviors that can lead to um, to a potential breach, um, either because uh, they want to impress others, um, or they um, they might be disgruntled with their employer, and they want to actually show they want to cause a potentially. Um, a, 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 a breach to the network because they want to show off their skills to their employer um, so that uh, their employer can see that uh, their skills are quite advanced. They can uh, break down the entire system if they want to. Um, so that kind of behavior is very common uh, to insider threats. And I was talking about Machiavellianism and the Machiavellian leader earlier. Um, and uh, usually, as I was saying, they're more manipulative. Um, they could um, potentially uh, do more planning or uh, usually they would be characterized as uh, um, insiders who um, uh, lead to a data breach intentionally. Um, they might create a new business ahead of time. They might recruit other employees to, jo to join them um, in stealing some of the data of the organization, transfer the data um, ahead of time before they leave uh, potentially uh, the organization. So there's a lot of planning um, and manipulation behind such, um, such an act. And that's why we call them the Machiavellian leaders usually. Um, and these subjects appear to be um, motivated by personality factors such as ambition and greed uh, or uh, disgruntlement, um, as I was saying, because they didn't get a promotion or even mental health uh, disturbances and issues. So uh, as you can see, there are different aspects that can lead to, to these kinds of behaviors. And nowadays is actually... Um, uh, we see more and more focus, especially in the private sector and large corporations, paying attention to, to these aspects and try to identify the potential insider threats to avoid um, uh, such risks. Uh, uh, so um, research around this area is really important at this point. Um, Actually, there is work um, around insider threat cases and uh, personality traits, specifically uh, um, dark triad personality traits. As you can see here uh, in this table, we have a number of um, uh, real cases of insider threat cases. And um, as you can see, most of uh, the dark triad personality characteristics are picked for most of them. Um, such as unusual need for attention, sense of entitlement, arrogance. Um, as I was describing in relation to self-esteem, these behaviors are kind of compensatory for uh, their low self-esteem, uh, lack of impulse control, lack of conscience, um, and potential chronic rule uh, violations uh, similar to uh, sociopathy. Uh, so um, actually a simple study like that shows how um, uh, personality traits and theories actually can lead us back to identifying specific insider cases. Um, so uh, a colleague and I looked at um, uh, trying to understand um, the different perceptions of, of cybercrime in underground forums, as I mentioned earlier. And um, actually, we were trying to understand how different members of, of underground forum groups um, uh, kind of perceive cybercrime. What do they perceive as crime? What do they perceive as legal or illegal? Uh, what are their attitudes toward law enforcement and potential punishments? Uh, and we did that by uh, kind of analyzing um, data scraped from uh, a large number of um, uh, forums, underground forums uh, collected by the Cambridge Cybercrime Center. The posts were selected from um, forums that were active uh, between 12, uh, 2012 and 2019. We used um, a combination of, of keywords to actually select 
um, uh, and target our uh, selection of um, uh, data uh, based on police, law enforcement, FBI, or getting caught, get caught. Um, and um, our search gave us back 26 forums um, that uh, included discussions around these topics. And in total, we had um, more than uh, 140,000 posts to analyze. Uh, we used uh, both qualitative and quantitative analysis for this uh, work and of course natural language processing but also thematic analysis and very briefly um, our top kind of biograms uh, um, and actually words appearing together um, were uh, uh, getting caught of course in law enforcement but we also identified um, a large kind of number of uh, or, or types of deviant behavior online uh, such as doxing, didos, bots, exploits, e-whoring, fraud, hacking, phishing, um, everything that you might expect. Um, and we had actually a very kind of large data set with discussions around um, around these behaviors and what they mean. Um, so um, very briefly here, um, uh, I wanted to mention some of the findings. As I was saying, we uh, tend to see a general optimistic bias and risk taking in these forums. So uh, offenders might underestimate uh, the skills or um, uh, kind of the capacity of law enforcement. So they expect that they wouldn't be identified or um, they wouldn't get caught. Um, but also they discuss risk avoidance strategies. How do you avoid being caught, uh, such as using common sense, using the VPN, removing uh, sensitive information or evidence that would allow for the linking of their identities. But also there were misconceptions around what is legal or what is not legal. And we had actually a large part of these, uh, these discussions around gaming and cheats um, and how if you're using public cheats and gaming, you're more kind of prone in, in getting caught. So um, uh, members were advised to use private cheats. Uh, but also when it comes to what is legal and what is illegal, um, for example, behaviors such as selling code for hacking, online harassment or cracking social media accounts were considered illegal. But um, hacking in um, online gaming and cheating was not considered illegal. Um, and then, of course, there were discussions around morality and ethics of how you're using your skills. Um, and as I was describing earlier, whether you want to use your skills for as a, as a white hat hacker or a black hat hacker um, and discussing uh, around the capacities of law enforcement um, on successful arrests or uh, the lack of focus on, on law enforcement on a kind of low skill, lower skilled um, hackers. Um, so kind of this completes some of the research and theoretical background around the online offenders. Um, as you can see, it's it's kind of a, a, a large area with different topics. Uh, so the, the literature there is actually quite extended at this point, extensive. Uh, so uh, this was a very, very brief uh, descri description, I, I would say. So very quickly going to the other side of the coin, uh, the human factor, looking at uh, the uh, individual, the online um, victim. Um, victims of cybercrime can experience serious consequences. And we see um, that in, in many occasions, actually, victims uh, might become uh, victimized a second or third time. So we have repeat victims who might uh, suffer health problems uh, or even require medical attention. Um, and they have specific needs that, from what I have identified, are not necessarily met um, from the criminal justice system or um, uh, other uh, kind of uh, uh, institutions uh, and services provided to um, victims. Um, along with my colleague Jason Ayres from uh, the University of Kent, we looked at the social and psychological impact of cyber attacks, looking at the online victimization. Um, and we saw that usually victims might regain their um, what was stolen uh, if, for example, someone hacked their account uh, or their, their email account. But um, uh, 
they're traumatized and they become, especially if they're a repeat victim, they might become very suspicious of the internet and the technology in general. Um, so we see possible effects such as outrage, anxiety, a preference for security over liberty, and that can mean and can have serious implications at the national level or a societal level, and little interest of adopting technology, as I was saying. And looking at online victimization, uh, due to I can say um, there's a there's lack of data in, in this uh, area um, for many reasons, because law enforcement are not really open in sharing um, uh, this kind of data or they're not even collecting this type of data because uh, and that actually the second is even more serious than the first. Um, so in order to understand the public response, uh, if we consider it a national level attack, for example, uh, we need to um, understand, first of all, the attacker, the target identity, the scale of the attack, or how the attack was communicated by a government, for example. Um, and we might have different types of attacker identities, as I was saying earlier, a terrorist, a hacktivist, or an organized criminal group. Um, and the target might be a random victim or um, uh, a very targeted specific group of people or a whole nation, for example. And as I was saying, the scale of the attack um, uh, can uh, be a very kind of specific targeting one individual or quite large uh, and extended scale uh, of the attack having um, uh, potentially uh, uh, cascading effects, a second, third order systems failing um, uh, if, if they target a specific website or a whole network, for example. Um, but as I was saying, the way a specific attack is communicated will impact not just the actual individuals and victims affected, but also the, the whole response of, um, uh, of individuals. Um, and usually we see uh, that uh, cyber attacks might not even be communicated, um, uh, which actually makes the potential reaction even or worse when they are revealed. Uh, but also we see recently that, for example, um, private organizations, telecoms, when they suffer an attack, they uh, they will report it and announce that. Uh, and that helps a lot in terms of um, retaining their clients uh, and not harming their reputation, basically. Here I have two examples very briefly of um, different level uh, and scale of attacks. Uh, back in 2014, you might remember a data breach in South Korea, which impacted actually most of the population, 20 million South Koreans, um, due to actually an insider threat, an IT worker um, who was uh, uh, stealing um, uh, credit card details uh, of uh, the Korea Credit Bureau and selling that to uh, marketing firms. And that led to 20 million South Koreans not being able to use their credit cards um, and actually being in the situation where they needed to apply for a new credit card, wait for that, which means they, they uh, could have potential quite um, uh, that could have a potential quite large impact and serious impact in their everyday life. In comparison to that kind of large or national level scale attack, uh, we have a smaller attack um, uh, uh, targeting Tesco's bank um, clients, uh, almost 9,000 customer accounts uh, were um, hacked and 2.5 million pounds were stolen. Um, that attack took place in 2017, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but here we see that um, Tesco's share price was down by 1.2%. So we don't see a huge impact. Um, its reputation has been damaged initially, but they recovered because they, they kind of announced that. And also uh, none of the customers um, lost any money. They all were reimbursed. So we see how, and they were refunded. So we see how a smaller scale attack might have impacted someone who was uh, using um, a Tesco kind of bank um, 
uh, bank account, but uh, that might uh, um, lead to them not being able to use their account for a day or two, um, not more than that. Uh, so the impact here is, is quite less compared to um, the one in South Korea. However, we see that when we talk about social and psychological impact of cyber attacks, we see, of course, that uh, uh, such an attack can cause serious social disruption to the daily life. Um, it can um, impact uh, emotions leading to outrage, anxiety, even panic. Um, and of course, lack of trust uh, to a whole government or the bank, uh, loss of confidence in technology, pessimism, or emotional sense of personal violation. And that is very common, uh, both in online and offline victims, feeling that sense of violation. Uh, but also it can lead to a sense of learned helplessness. So not being, feeling that I'm not able to do anything. I will be a victim anyway at some point. And that has serious implications to the effectiveness of cybersecurity awareness campaigns, for example. Uh, these campaigns try to promote um, a kind of secure uh, behavior online, but if you've been a victim, uh, you're not ha you don't ha necessarily have that confidence that you can apply all the, the advice provided, um, leading to low uptake of protective security behaviors. Uh, and of course, at the national level, it can impact the economy. Uh, the reputation, uh, and it can have um, political implications as well. Um, I will conclude with um, uh, a recent study specifically on online victimization. Um, uh, and, and for this study, due to the lack of data, as I was mentioning, I took different approaches here. Um, I was looking at uh, the, the potential implications uh, for crime prevention. And to do that, I, um, uh, I decided to interview a number of stakeholders, um, but also I identified uh, a number of victim impact statements of fraud cases. Uh, so these were the two kind of areas of or two methods of data collection. Um, so I was saying I interviewed a number of stakeholders from um, Metropolitan Police, the Police Constabulary, the Organized Crime Units, but also experts in the private sector and academics. And also I looked at 83 data breach victim impact statements uh, who provided information to the demographics of the victims, information about the incident, but also the impact. And this is quite interesting because law enforcement not, don't necessarily collect data on the impact of such an incident to the victim. They mostly collect information around what happened, the incident, um, the demographics, but they don't go um, to the kind of touching upon the impact on, on victims. Um, so in that case, uh, most of the victims uh, were women um, aged uh, between 27 and 52 years old. Um, their personal details were um, actually breached between 2005 and 2019. And the incident of that data breach uh, was caused due to them providing their personal details uh, to a company they trusted. So that company then sold their um, uh, uh, personal information to third companies. Um, so that led to a number of um, incidents, uh, some of them um, actually noticed their bank accounts uh, being breached or their email accounts. And of course, they were receiving a large amount of um, uh, advertisements of phishing emails. Um, and um, all of the impact statements actually talked about that violation of their privacy. Um, they all felt being violated. Um, and um, of course, the emotional harms to stress and anxiety was continuous because um, until the victims identifying that uh, their information was uh, uh, breached or sold, um, it took a number of years. So for a number of years, they were actually uh, suffering the impact of, of that breach. And as you can see here, um, most of the symptoms mentioned were both psychological, emotional, but also health related. So starting from stress and anxiety or even depression for some, um, uh, we also saw uh, symptoms such as panic, frustration, anger, fear, um, and even in being embarrassed that this happened to them. And of course, all these uh, symptoms led to lack of sleep for some of uh, the victims, so leading to, um, uh, to actual physical and, and health impact. Um, 
as I was saying, um, the interviews with uh, experts coming from law enforcement, academics, but also uh, working in the private sector, um, uh, actually, uh, the discussion with them uh, revealed uh, a number of gaps when it comes to prevention and response um, of online victimization. Um, and um, uh, I saw a lack of support of victims. So um, after asking the question, OK, what happens when you identify victim, um, apart from collecting the information, what happens next? Um, the, there isn't really a clear answer to the, the kind of uh, uh, type of services that are provided to support online victims. And again, I mentioned the difference between offline and online victims because for offline victims there are clear guidelines, um, uh, different online, uh, for example, um, support services. Uh, but for online victims, we don't have a clear guide uh, of, of what happens, who supports them and how. Um, and we have a lack of understanding of the barriers and facilitators for victim reporting. And we see now that uh, a number of academics are looking at how to kind of enhance that um, the reporting behavior of victims. Um, also, there's a lack of training of law enforcement and judiciary around online victimization. And this is uh, actually leading to that lack of data collection around the impact on victims that I was mentioning. Um, and in general, the lack of standardization when it comes to data collection around online victimization. We might, we might see different, um, uh, for example, um, 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 in different parts of the UK, law enforcement collecting um, different uh, data, not following a standardized approach, we can, which can have implications for any academic who wants to do um, research in this uh, area. Um, so to summarize, uh, we discussed today a number of studies and theories around personality traits. Um, and as I was explaining, these characteristics um, and uh, um, uh, kind of findings uh, in this uh, uh, area, in this field, can be used for developing prevention activities and interventions for delinquency. As I was saying, some approaches might work um, for um, specific offenders, or if we consider at the personality level, uh, might uh, uh, be effective for um, uh, uh, someone uh, who is an extrovert, but not for someone who is an introvert, for example. Uh, but also these findings provide useful insights and it can inform practices in policing, uh, aiming to interrupt cybercrime. As I was mentioning, the approach that the National Crime Agency was following with the CIS and Desist program, um, uh, which took a lot of background work, understanding the target group, uh, understanding their um, attitudes, perceptions before developing that intervention. Um, and um, of course, of course, gaps identified in uh, prevention and response uh, in cybercrime can inform policy making. And I think this is where we are at this point. There's a lot of discussion around online harms. You might have heard about the new legislation coming out. So research in this area uh, directly informs um, uh, policy making. And that summarizes and concludes this presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, happy to um, have a discussion and answer any questions. Thank you very much, Maria, for such an interesting talk. Um, it, just to let you know, I can't see your, your video. I'm not sure whether anybody else can see. Yeah. I, uh, I think Maria kind of froze midway through the talk, but uh, that might be a Zoom issue. Hi, Maria. Apologies for running a few minutes late. Are you still, oh, is she still there or is she gone? Um, no. Oh, yeah. yes, she's there. She's there, she hasn't got her video on. Ah. Sorry, I'm back. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, question, question, guys. I've got a quick one. Hi, Maria. A apologies for Hello. running a little bit late to your talk, but thank you so much for the talk. It was uh, incredibly interesting. And I think, you know, as, as a comment, it just reiterates to me how many different factors are at play here and the, the, the approach that I, coming from the more technical end of the spectrum, have to consider. You know, it just blows open your mind that these one-fit-all approaches that we've had in cyber for so long really don't fit at all. And my question, however, is with regards to specifically insider misuse, and there's been some talk in the literature about the use of personality questionnaires mm -hmm. as a recruitment tool for yeah. trying to identify who may or may not be suitable for the organization. And I was just interested to, to know your thoughts on whether you think that's a good idea or not, because 
I guess there are weaknesses to that approach. For sure. Yes, there are. And actually, this is a question I, uh, I get a lot uh, in, this, uh, in these presentations. Uh, and yes, there are specific models looking um, and, and uh, actually applying theories and trying to identify uh, personality traits. But I see them more focusing on whether someone is able to be the leader of a specific group and basically allocate specific um, employees to specific roles rather than trying to identify um, an insider threat, for example. Um, so I don't see, although there is interest from different organizations in identifying insider threats, I don't see um, these theories 